Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this evening, Best Business Practices for Farmers Market Farmers. Um, my name is Georgia Stanley, and I work for the BC Association of Farmers Markets and have been fortunate to work with a great team of researchers at Kwantlen on this joint project, which you'll be learning more about this evening. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank our project funders for making this work possible. The project was funded in part by Van City Credit Union and in part by the governments of Canada and British Columbia through programs delivered by the Investment Agriculture Foundation. And we have three research associates from the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems at Kwantlen presenting this evening. Welcome to Emily Hansen, Wallapak Palasub, and Caroline Chu. And thank you everyone for joining us. And without further delay, I'll turn it over to Emily so we can get started. Thanks for the intro, Georgia. Um, as Georgia mentioned, this webinar is made possible through a partnership between the BC Association of Farmers Markets and the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. So before we get started, I'm just going to give a little introduction to those two organizations. Uh, the BC Association of Farmers Markets is a nonprofit organization that exists to support, develop, and promote farmers markets in BC. They currently support over 145 farmers markets and 3,000 vendors, which includes 1,000 small scale farmers. The Institute for Sustainable Food Systems is an applied research and extension unit at the Richmond campus of Kwantlen Polytechnic University. Our applied research focuses on developing regional food systems in the areas of agriculture and food, economics, community health, policy, and environmental integrity. Extension programming provides information and support for farmers, communities, businesses, policymakers, and community collaboration is central to all of our work. Um, before we go any further, um, all of the presenters are just going to say hello. Uh, so I'm Emily Hansen, and I'm a research associate at the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems. I've been working on this project for the past several months, and that work included interviewing 15 farmers across BC about their best business practices. Good evening, and this is Wallapak Polasap. I am also a research associate at the Institute, and I've been assisting Emily on this project as well. Hi everyone, my name is Caroline. I'm the uh, coordinator of the Farm School programs at ISFS. Okay, so tonight the webinar is scheduled from 7 to 8.30. Uh, we're going to start off with an overview of the project um, that we've talked about already um, that informed the content of the webinar, and then we're going to get right into the content discussing the best business practices for successful farmer, farmers market farmers. And we've organized these into four key areas of performance. Um, they include financial management, human resources, marketing, and farm operations. And we'll explain a little bit more about those later. Um, at the end of the session, we're going to set aside about half an hour for questions and comments from participants. Uh, some of you posed questions when signing up for the webinar, which was great, and we hope that these questions will be addressed during the session. But if you have any remaining questions or need clarification um, on some of the ideas, please ask us at the end. So I think um, you'll see the chat or the question um, bar in the webinar dashboard. And throughout the session, if you want to type any questions you have um, into that section, we will do our best at the end to, to look through them um, and answer any questions you might have. So if you have um, questions along the way, please type them in, and then we'll get to them at the end. Uh, so for this project, we conducted interviews with 15 farmers across BC and identified a number of best business practices that helped contribute to their success. We're now in the process of sharing the findings from this project. Um, and we're going to share those through a print publication, market, a marketing toolkit, and of course through this webinar. And we'll provide PDF copies of the publication and the marketing toolkit at the end of the webinar. So with this project, we aim to document and share best business practices of farmers selling at BC farmers markets 
and we had three primary goals. We wanted to identify the path to a successful small-scale direct market farming operation, to develop a strong, strong direction and support for local direct, direct market food systems, and increase awareness of small-scale farm, farmers selling direct to the public through farmers markets. So the farmers we interviewed um, either self-identified or were suggested to us by farmers market managers across the province. And this process was facilitated with help from the BC Association of Farmers Markets and the Young Agrarians. All the farmers that we interviewed are currently selling at farmers markets as at least one of their marketing channels. So who exactly did we interview? Um, we talked to a total of 15 farmers, and we conducted these interviews between September and December of 2016. Uh, we talked to 10 mixed vegetable and fruit producers, four meat producers, and one uh, dairy, and cheese, dairy producer and cheese maker. And this slide just shows you a list of those who participated in the case study project and their respective regions. So you might be wondering what we mean by best business practices. For the purpose of this project, we consider best business practices to be the practices and techniques that have proven to be instrumental in achieving success in direct market farm business operations. They're often developed through a variety of methods, including trial and error and cooperation with other farmers. By sharing these best business practices through the project, we hope that farmers can learn from the successes and struggles of their peers and create strong local and regional food systems across the province. So as I mentioned before, we've organized the best business practices into four key areas of performance, uh, financial management, human resources, marketing, and farm operations. Um, and we're going to outline these in detail as we go through the content of the webinar. So now I'm going to pass things over to Wallapak, who's going to start off by taking us through some of the best business practices, which are related to financial management. Thank you, Emily. So I think it's not wrong to say that many of you, especially for small-scale farmers, go into farming because the love of farming and the lifestyle, rather than the hope of getting really rich. If this is the case, you may feel that the finance side of farming seems um, seems such a burden to you. However, it can't be avoided. If you want to continue to farm, then you have to be able to manage your finance well so that your farm is financially viable. Therefore, it is useful to have basic knowledge in financial statements. That is, you know how to read it and make heads or tails out of it. If you really don't like to prepare your own financial statements and can afford it, then you should hire an accountant or bookkeeper or try farm, farm accounting software to help you deal with farm finances. So that issue aside from the experiences of our successful farmers, there are three other best practices on financial management. So the first one that was recommended was to evaluate management cap capability and market readiness when considering new farm enterprises. So at some point, you might feel that it is time to expand your farm operation, either as a challenge or an interest or as a business strategy. And one of the most useful things is to make a business plan for, new, for your new project. Your business plan will cover a wide range of topics, including business and personal goals, your current operations, human resources, market, and finance. So making a plan will reduce the unexpected and make your investment pay off. It makes you think about things that maybe you wouldn't normally think about. For example, some product may be easy to grow, but it might not fit well with your existing schedule. Or that you might be really good at growing something, but there might not be a market for it. So throughout our webinar here, we will be talking about other best practices that can help you make a good business plan. So the next practice is to establish record-keeping systems and align them with business goals and personal values. Record-keeping is everything. And you know what? I have to say that with the big exclamation mark at the end, because the record-keeping provides you all, provide you with all sort of information. When you keep good financial records, you won't have to pull your hair or have massive headaches during the tax season. But in addition to financial records, 
You also need to keep farm production records as well, such as product, production methods, the cropping history, or even the weather. Record keeping helps you track your progress and manage your farm, reminding you of what you need to do, what needs to be done, and what you can expect. It also helps you remember what type of things went well and what did not. And with good records, it can also make your life easier when you need to obtain loans or grants. There are several options to go about keeping records. Some people prefer the traditional way of pen and papers or for those who feel a little bit more comfortable with computer, um, you might set up your own record keeping with a spreadsheet or use a computer software. And these days, you can even use your smartphone to do record keeping on the go as well. There are several record keeping apps for smartphone now. So at the end of this presentation, we will give you some resources that might help you to learn more about software or smartphone apps. Our successful farmer suggested keeping business keeping business goals and personal values in mind when keeping records because this will help you prioritize tasks and increase awareness of what is important to you most and why you do things the way you do. Say that if you're passionate about well, the well-being and health of your animals, you will have to establish a record-keeping system that allows you to track the changes in the animal health. And the bottom line here is you must keep records if you want to be successful. And the next tip is to determine the economic visibility of the new or existing enterprises through enterprise analysis or partial budgeting. So once you have your find, uh, once you have your record in place, you need to process this data into information so that this data will be helpful to you. For example, you can construct your farm income statement and you know how much profit your farm is making this year. However, a successful farmer would take a further step and perform what we call an enterprise analysis or partial budgeting. That is, you want to know how each of your enterprise, whether it's growing potatoes or greenhouse tomatoes or raising chicken, so you want to know how each of your enterprise performs. You can answer questions like how many profits are lost if from growing a cucumber this year, or which enterprise takes up most of your time and this is especially useful because you want to be able to tell whether it's worth doing something or not and how can you improve your operation financially. You can also use enterprise analysis to determine the feasibility of your new product. Say that you don't currently grow P-tips and you want to do it. By utilizing the enterprise budget, it gives you an idea of what it takes to grow P-tips, how much it might cost, and what kind of profit you might be making. So on our institute website, we have over 20 enterprise budgets for small-scale farming operations. We'll provide you with the link to these budgets at the end of our presentation as well. And if you have questions of how to use them, so you can feel free to contact us. And next, Emily will give you some real-life examples um, that we have learned from our successful farmers on the um, financial management. Okay, so we heard overwhelmingly from the farmers that we interviewed that financial management and planning are critical, but it's common for farmers to neglect uh, developing these skills or undertaking these practices because they're understandably focusing on improving their production practices and finding new markets for what they're producing. As well as I mentioned, basic financial literacy is a must for the success of any farm business. Farmers who don't have business experience or want to improve can look for opportunities for training and support. Running a small farm business means that you're responsible for a lot of moving parts, but this doesn't mean that you have to do it all alone. A couple of farmers that we interviewed, Doug and Gemma from Zachlin Heritage Farm in Surrey, enrolled in a formal mentorship program through the Young Agrarians to learn about farm business management from an experienced farmer in their region. They also took farm business management courses through Kwantlen Polytechnic University as they were preparing to start their business. Sasha and Tyler from Cutter Ranch in the Kootenai region also recognized that they would need specific business and financial management training. So Sasha took online accounting courses um, and they were able to take advantage of some traditional small business training opportunities. So farmers can look for opportunities that are uh, related to small farm business development or just regular small businesses. 
Many farmers that we interviewed also hired bookkeepers or had dedicated staff who managed their finances. Charlene from Earth Apple Farm and Lydia from Cropthorn Farm express, expressed to us that it was really important that this was someone that they really trusted and could be honest with about the financial state of their farm. Um, in both of these cases, these women worked with family members to help them manage their farm finances. Our conversations also uh, reinforce what Wallapak said earlier about good record keeping. Uh, these well-kept records are used to help you measure your success and can also come in handy when you're trying to make decisions about changes to your farm operation. The farmers that we spoke to often approached record keeping by thinking about what kind of information they would need to make their decisions. Uh, about production or staffing or new capital projects, and then they would prioritize the collection of that information. Uh, Gemma and Doug from Zacklin Heritage Farm have been closely tracking the vegetable in inventory at the beginning and the end of farmers market days. Uh, this shows them sales trends over the season and has helped them to more accurately do their crop planning for upcoming seasons. With these records, they have a really good picture of what was sold and when throughout the season. Alicia and Delaney from Icecap Organics in Pemberton have also focused on developing systems for record keeping since they started their business eight years ago. They carefully track inputs like labor, seed, and fuel for each crop, um, which can seem like a daunting task for market gardeners, but the information has really helped them to plan a good crop mix that has allowed them to get a better financial return from the market and meet, meet their financial targets. Uh, many of the, farm, the small farmers that we talked to are balancing a variety of enterprises, um, and this was another reason that they expressed the importance of keeping of good financial management and record keeping. Tyler and Sasha at Cutter Ranch have had good success experimenting with poultry and even with growing garlic, but they found that these enterprises took too much time and focus away from their pasture-raised lamb and pork, um, which was really what they were passionate about and sort of the focus of their business. For them, something like beef production was a much better fit with their existing production and marketing strategies. They also feel that being successful in their livestock operation means that they need to carefully observe and monitor the health of their herds. So new enterprises that take away from this focus don't fit well into their business model. Now I'm going to turn it back to Wallapak, um, and she's going to talk about some of the best business practices that are related to human resources. Hi again. So just like any other businesses, farm business is no exception. Human is the most important thing to run the operation. So I've read from the recent survey of the Canadian farms in the dollars and cents report, the first key drive to having a successful farm financial success is the farm operator's propensity to learn and improve. So even though you know if you are just the only person on your farm, it's still you still have to to um, learn and improve yourself to be successful. And generally, for a small-scale farming operation, human resource on farm probably consists of you or and or um, the owner, uh, with, oh, sorry, <laughs> consists of you and also maybe your farm cooperator. And also some of you may have a few paid and or unpaid farm helpers as well. And when your spouse or family members are involved as um, farm operators or employees, things could get complicated. So we'll see in the next slides of what business practices are recommended. So the first one is to seek mentors and mentorship to gain knowledge and build skills in business management and production. Generally, skills come with practice. You can perfect your farming skills each season. This process can be done smoother, though, if you have an experienced mentor to guide you. Your mentor can help you learn quicker and avoid certain mistakes that you might not have thought about. You can seek mentor formally through applying to be an apprentice, apprentice in a farm or apply to have a mentor from a mentorship program, or you can seek a mentor informally through networking. 
a successful mentor and mentee relationship is one where both of you are open about your businesses and you discuss your goals of your relationship and also keep in mind the knowledge that the mentee's business is not a recreation of the mentor's business. So the mentor is there to help you learn and grow in your own way so that you can manage without them once the mentor-mentee relationship is over. And the next best practice is to establish or connect with networks that reflect your business, production, and personal values. Pharma networks are very important when you are able to talk to someone who share the same values. They can understand you a little bit more. You may have similar experiences and difficulties that you can share with one another. Networking can also give you more opportunities to collaborate. So maybe you find ways to improve or expand your operations or solve your problems collectively. Or even if you still cannot find any solutions together, it is still very therapeutic to be able to talk to someone who understands. So how do you tap into one of these networks? You can formally join different organizations, or you can just do it the traditional way of meeting people, for example, at the, farmer, at the farmer's market or other events. Or you can do it online with social networking tools. This is, this is especially useful when you have busy schedule and you have no time to physically go out and meet or talk to your peers. In addition to a farmer's network, another type of network is between farmers and academic institutions. Academic institutions can be sources of useful information or resources. And farmers' participation and collaboration can ensure that this type of network is beneficial to both parties. For example, us here at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, we are here to assist you in any way we can. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions or need some help, we're here to help and you can contact us anytime. And the next practice is to integrate family members into the business in ways that reflect their strengths and professional goals. So at some point in life, you might find that your family members, especially your children, may show interest in farming and would like to receive an opportunity to farm. Working with family members can be very satisfying, but at the same time can also um, be very difficult as well, among, especially among the inter intergeneration members. Family member employees can also create complication among non-family employees, especially if the roles and responsibilities are not clear. So is your family member employee there to learn to be the next farm boss, or is he or she there to be just like any other workers? And if you don't communicate clearly about the work expectations and rewards, you and your family members may find yourself at odds with each other. But, and also another uh, tip is by slowly bringing a family member on board is very important. You might want to use a trial run or a probation period to start their work at the farm. And the key here is to give assignments based on their interests, strengths, and goals. When they are ready, you have to give them an opportunity to lead or explore new initiatives on their own. If you have more than one child working for you, then a clear succession plan should be established and communicated clearly as well. And next is to communicate personal and business goals clearly and honestly with family or business partners. Good communication is one of the key ingredients to any successful relationship. If your farm business partner also happens to be your spouse, that communication in farm business can challenge your relationship. The key of communication is always having an open and honest conversation about what you and your business partner want and how you want to get there together. And you have to make sure that you are on the same page and don't assume or take things for granted just because the other person is your spouse, family member, or best friend. To communicate well, oftentimes you need a business meeting. You shouldn't discuss business casually over a family dinner or in the bedroom. And if at some point you are not sure how to start a difficult conversation, then seeking a professional help can be useful. You can hire an outside mediator or communication consultant to facilitate the communication on a challenging topic. And remember, communication skills can be improved. 
if you think you are not a good communicator, you can find a book or a workshop to attend to improve your communication skills. And the last past practice on this um, human resource is to create employment opportunities that attract and retrain and retain the right kind of employees. When your farm is big enough that it requires extra help, having good people to work for you can make your life a lot easier. As farming is seasonal, it is a plus if the same good people keep coming back to you year after year because these people already know how to work well with each other and you know they already know how things on the farm are supposed to be done the way you like them to be done and good workers are usually hard to find but to keep them on your farm regularly is even harder you don't want to find yourself having to hire a new person in the middle of your farming season the task of writing a good job description, interviewing, and confirming references are tedious, but shouldn't be ignored. So by creating a rewarding job opportunities on your farm, you have a better chance of attracting and retaining your best workers. When I'm talking about rewards, it does not necessarily mean only financial rewards. Financial reward does do the trick of attracting people, but to attract the right kind of people to your operation. You need to think about other things, such as um, how the job that you offer will help them achieve their goals. So where do you find people to work for you? For you? Your potential employees may be the locals in your neighborhood, volunteers from near and far, or even foreign workers. Um, next, Emily will tell you more about what experiences of our successful farmers have regarding human resource management. Okay, so again, um, as Wallapak described, human resources on the farm can really impact the success of your business. And it's also important to keep in mind that your approach to managing human resources is likely to change uh, with seasonal shifts and as your business grows and develops. So networking may not seem like a human resource strategy, but it is an important way to learn and to tap into personal and professional support when you need it most. Uh, these networks can take a variety of forms. Alicia and Delaney from IceCap Organics have managed to tap into a number of farming, have managed to tap into a number of farming networks, including large conventional and small organic farming sectors in the Sea to Sky region. They recognize that they have a lot to learn from more experienced farmers and have invested in building up these supportive networks. They also draw inspiration and new knowledge from the small scale organic farming sector in the United States. And these connections have largely, largely been made possible through social media, through social media um, and mainly through Instagram. Many of the farmers we talked to, including Lydia from Cropthorn Farm, described farmers markets as a venue for building a supportive network. The farm, lots of farmers talk to us about how valuable this has been for them to connect with people who really understand their experience with farmers. Uh, these relationships often extend beyond the farmers market and have become good sources of personal and professional support. So another important consideration for a lot of the farmers that we talked to was figuring out how their family members would relate to each other and to the farm business. This can include a spouse or a partner, children, extended family, and both those who work directly on the farm and contribute in other ways by providing childcare or financial support. Tyler and Sasha from Cutter Ranch have recently been experimenting with dividing up their responsibilities with Tyler taking on sales, marketing, and branding, and Sasha to be more focused on production aspects and livestock management. This new strategy has allowed them to take advantage of their individual strengths and preferences and created a more formal way for them to relate to one another on the farm. They also now have a clear understanding of who is responsible for what. They admit that there's still a lot of crossover, but it's definitely created a new dynamic and allowed them to be more focused on building and expanding their business. 
It's common amongst the farmers we interviewed to be uh, to experiment with different variety with a variety of different employment models as the needs of the farm change. All of this has helped farmers to figure out what kind of employees are right for their farm. Robert from Pilgrim's Produce has children who used to help him out in the early years, but have not really shown an interest in farming as a career. So he's moved more towards a model of long-term paid staff who are now becoming part of the succession plan for the farm. They work closely with Robert um, while he's still working full-time on the farm, learning the systems of the farm and have become um, more invested in it and even started to take ownership and created more diversity on the farm by adding new enterprises like growing mushrooms or um, introducing a flock of chickens. I'm sure most of you know that having staff quit mid-season can be a huge disruption for any farm and it can also add a lot of stress for you and for other employees. A strategy for dealing with this um, comes from the Gourlays from Little Qualicum Cheese Works and they recognize that lots of people romanticize working on a dairy farm or really any farm for that matter um, and also in their cheese plant and that people may not fully grasp the realities of this kind of job. So recently when they were hiring new staff, they invited prospective employees to experience what a day in the life of working in the cheese plant would be like. And this strategy was used to help new employees get a better sense of what the expectations of the position would be. Many of the farmers that we interviewed talked to us about hum how human resources is a major growing edge for their farm and emphasize the importance of exploring what works best on the farm and inevitably making mistakes. But being sure that they always keep communication open um, with those that are working for them and with them and being aware of their own management styles and preferences. Uh, so now I'm going to pass it over to Caroline, and she's going to talk about the best business practices associated with marketing. Thanks, Emily and Walpack. So sometimes the marketing strategy can get neglected in the farmer's plan. Um, I mean, as a farmer myself, I have a I could I have a marketing plan at the beginning of the season, but as it gets busy, you know, it starts to drop off my plate, and and things just don't go according to the strategy. And understandably, you know, a farmer needs to acquire many skills, and just to mention a few, you know, they're growing food, they have to know, know about soil health, pest management, water management, mechanics, and crop planning, and marketing, and many more. So when one of two things kind of falls off the table, especially during the height of the season, um, it's, it's quite understandable. So sometimes we think that we are growing good food for people to eat, so people should want to buy the vegetables. Um, farming is a lifestyle, but farming is still a business. There is still competition in an, in an open market, and farmers still need to show customers why their veggies are quote-unquote better. So one question that farmers should think about is, why should customers buy carrots from you and not the farmers at the next stall? As with any business, um, marketing, creating your own brand is just as important and needs just as much effort and time to craft. So in this section, I'll briefly talk about crafting your story and using that story to create your brand and um, your brand and advertise it, then continue to do market research to further establish your story in the market. So the first best business practice, craft an engaging story about your farm. So I took a business planning workshop a few years ago um, and one thing that the presenters talked about that really stuck out for me was how much they emphasized on crafting your story. Product quality and pricing are important, but we should never underestimate the power of customers relating to your story. That is the value added. Having customers relate and invest in your story will go a long way for your business as that creates customer loyalty. You can sort of think about it, or I like to think about it as um, like me applying for a job, I'm interested in the job itself, the day-to-day -day tasks, the, the pay, the products and the, or service, um, but at the same time, corporate value is a big factor as well. Does the picture, bigger picture of the company and mission statement align with my own values? So if so, this tends to create the employee loyalty, 
So I see um, the farm business story creating a similar impact to your customers. Um, and the next step. So following that, um, having said that, I'm not you know, encouraging you to just make up a story that you, you might think it will be engaging. Um, you have to be transparent and authentic about your story and express clearly on the whys, what's, where's, and how's of your business journey. Authenticity and the rawness of your journey is what captures the audience. And throughout the season or throughout, you know, your, your business journey, make sure you stick to your story. Although the direction of your business could change and your marketing strategy does alter, the core values of your story and business should stay relatively the same throughout, throughout because that is the core of who you are and what your business is about. Try to emphasize why your story is unique from other stories. People can see how much you care about what you do through the way you talk to them at the farmer's market or you know, when they come and pick up your CSA, through your display and the quality of your produce. Having a strong story is uh, especially powerful for marketing channels such as a CSA. You know, with so many farms doing a CSA, customers usually pick a farm based on their story because at the time of sign up for a new farmer, they are taking a leap of faith regarding vegetable quality. And lastly, the business planning workshop that I took also emphasized on crafting the story because if you want to apply for a bank loan or get some sponsorship, um, these people will usually read the story first as part of your business plan. So within the first five minutes, um, you have to capture their interest and attention. Okay, um, when customers choose to buy at farmers markets or through community supported agriculture programs or CSAs or at your farm store, they're making a choice to know where their food is coming from. They want to know about the farm where the food is grown and about the farmers that grow it. So as Caroline mentioned in the previous section, your marketing strategy can really take advantage of this. Uh, some examples that we learned from the farmers we interviewed, Lydia from Cropthorn Farm has a relatively large farm team and many of her field workers don't regularly attend farmers markets. So she publishes profiles of these individuals on her website which helps customers to understand the people behind the production. It also helps them to understand that farming takes a lot of work, um, and even though they might not see these people reg regularly at the farmer's market, they're really involved in um, bringing that food to the table each week. Lisa from Sterling Springs Chicken uh, relies on social media, especially her Facebook page, to share behind the scenes photos and updates from the farm, and this really helps uh, farmers or customers stay connected to the farm, especially if they're only interacting with the farm uh, at the farmer's market every one or two weeks. You want to make sure that you maintain that connection and that relationship um, when you don't have the opportunity to meet face-to-face. -face. And Ron and Aaron from Stein Mountain Farm are committed to attending every farmer's market in person as opposed to sending other farm staff. Um, they capitalize on the opportunity to connect directly with their customers. And even though this is a huge time and travel commitment for them coming from the interior to Vancouver every week, they have seen the return on investment uh, through customer loyalty. So um, after having crafted your story, um, it's time to, to let the world know about you and, and the farm. Take the time to develop the marketing platforms to show people what you are about. So the first practice, um, use farmer's markets as the entry point to direct market sales and a gateway to other marketing channels. For startup small-scale farmers, uh, small-scale farmer, farmer's markets um, are often the first marketing channel that a farmer will sell through. Um, why? Because there is no pressure on vegetable quantity. Prices are pretty much set by the market for you. You put your name and face out there for customers to meet, um, and you get to interact with customers and talk about your story. And, it's, and I think it's always a fun experience for new farmers because you're, you know, you're in a food hub where people are there to buy your food, and then you're surrounded by other local farmers as well. And aside from getting to see what sells and what, what doesn't, many connections are made here. 
direct marketing feeds on open and honest communication between the farmer and customers. So as a first step, I think it's one of the best ways to be involved with the local food scene in your community. Uh, next, dedicate time and resources to educate consumers about new products and services. So take advantage of the face-to-face -face interactions with customers as you may or may not be doing farmers markets for a long time. Uh, so use this time to develop that customer base and relationship and educate them about you as a farmer, your farm, your farm workers, your veggies, or your uh, meat products and your services. I find that even though the trend is leaning towards the more convenient and virtual uh, shopping trend, a good portion of customers still highly value the physical interactions with their farmers. As I mentioned in the first section, part of the value added that people are paying into is the direct farm to market of uh, farm to market of the product as well as the interaction with the farmers. So as a farmer, you also automatically take on the role of an advocate for farming and local food. So educate. Um, the next practice is use a variety of marketing channels to increase exposure and gain market share. In addition to gaining market share, expanding your marketing channels also reduces your risk in the business. For example, farmers markets are generally pretty steady. However, customers still fluctuate depending on weather and, you know, say long weekends. <clears throat> so whether you like it or not, it is worth keeping up to date with the newest technology. With such a fast changing world of technology, it is beneficial for farmers to take advantage of the trending marketing and social media platforms. For example, nowadays there are lots of farmers, I know a lot of farmers selling veggies just through a um, messaging app on their phone. You know, the pros and cons of so social media platforms of um, Instagram or Facebook, et cetera, are debatable, but one thing that is true is that it is one of the best ways to connect to a very wide demographic with one simple click. Many advertise advertising companies nowadays simply use social media, so it's a very powerful tool. Many people still use a website as it is more a traditional way of displaying your business, but make sure to keep it up to date or else it may actually do more harm than good. So that's the digital world. But physically, expanding your marketing channels will increase your market presence. So don't only do markets, maybe start a small CSA or a fresh sheet uh, for select organizations, restaurants, wholesalers, or some, or even some like one-off special markets. Say in Vancouver, we have um, the zero waste market. That happens once in a while. Um, so after having done have, having done farmers markets for a while, you will start to realize what sell well and what doesn't, and different techniques in selling at the market. You might have to fit all around with the display depending on the direction of the sun that day or where your booth is located. If it's a slow day, maybe start sampling your products. I personally always find that very helpful. Or you might just have to step out of your comfort zone of being at the back of the tent and engage with customers and talk to them. As a farmer, you must be adaptable, flexible, and very creative in how you display your products. Uh, for example, when I was selling a new veggie at the market, it did not sell very well by just sitting on the table. So I, I started sampling and changing up my signage by comparing its flavor to a better known veggie. I printed out photos of the dish cooked and uncooked, and it sold out immediately for the next couple of weeks. Um, however, you know, I think marketing is not a one-size-fits-all technique. It's a trial and error um, process, and you just have to keep experimenting. Uh, the next next this business practice is uh, work cooperatively to access local markets and gain the kinds of scale. So new small startup farmers may find it hard to market at their scale at, at its full potential. With so much uncertainty in farming, new farmers don't always go all out in the first year. So I think it's wise to start small, develop a scope, and figure out how to grow things and what grows best in your area. So it could be beneficial to work collaboratively with other farmers in marketing efforts. The pros of this are shared effort, time and resources, there's cost sharing, there's more bounty to make the table more appealing and abundant, and there's less stress knowing that you 
could have another farm as plan B in case of a crop failure. So there is a growing interest in local food and local farmers, especially with farmers becoming an aging population. As the community of customers become you know, more affluent and people be more aware of healthier options and want to eat healthier. So try your hardest to be business ready when the opportunity comes or when market momentums are strong in the community. Try to be a step ahead and capture the market gaps. Let consumers know that purchasing food directly from the farmers will lead to more food dollars going directly to the farmer and back into their community. It's a win-win for everyone. Try to make more connections with your local restaurants, organizations, um, food caterers, and chefs to continue to build that relationship. And with everything put online now, capitalize that momentum on your social media platforms. So, so social media platforms are all about the number of people your posts can reach. So an effective way to find uh, to maximize that potential is to partner up with different companies and have other companies tag you is a very effective way of advertising. Okay, I'm just going to jump in here with um, some examples before we go on any further in the marketing section. Um, so as Caroline was describing, building your brand is about finding opportunities to get your name and your product out there. Uh, prior to getting involved in their local farmers markets in the Kootenai region, Tyler and Sasha from Cutter Ranch were delivering their pasture-raised meat products to consumers as far away as Vancouver. With greater local recognition that they were able to gain through their farmers markets, um, they're now launching a rebranding effort for their business and building up their local clientele. For many other farmers that we talked to, um, they've also used farmers markets as a stepping stone and a point to connect with chefs who may come and buy directly from them at the market or provide an opportunity to distribute their weekly CSA boxes. Lisa and Hens from Sterling Springs Chicken have built a name for themselves by connecting with chefs and other local food producers in the Okanagan. They're showcasing their products and building a local following for their brand in the region. Um, that's really capitalizing on the momentum of uh, growing interest in local food. Um, so the next Next best business practice is um, to test new markets by starting small and focusing on delivering quality products and building new client relationships. Also understand the unique needs of the cons consumer market where farm products will be sold. So I know some farms who don't financially need to do markets anymore and still decide to do it purely for doing market research and for having that visual presence at markets. Food trends, food fads change so fast nowadays so as a business, you want to know these changing trends. Whether you agree with the trend is a different story, but you should at least be aware of what consumers are asking for. Also, it's important to know what consumers want, as that will likely, likely change your farm operation plans. Even if you grow the best tasting lettuce in the world, um, it, it doesn't even matter if it's not really an in-demand product or that it doesn't sell well at all at the market. Also, demands and food trends can vary drastically, drastically from community to community, region to region. So if you want to be a permanent food producer in your select markets, dedicate the time and effort to understand the needs and gaps of each market. And lastly, just looping back to the point of crafting a story, it's, an, it's important for farmers to find a smooth spot for balancing business values and responding to market demands. If consumer demand for something that is not exactly in line with your values. How do you deal with that? And ultimately, you want to keep your tra story transparent and authentic. So marketing efforts is definitely an ongoing process as it keeps changing. Um, and so as nice as it is to be able to keep doing the same, th same thing or keep a similar strategy year after year, um, farmers need to keep up with the changing market demands and trends and need to be adaptable. So something that we learned from talking with farmers was that there's a real struggle often between uh, growing and selling what you want and offering a diversity of products that people actually want to buy. And this is something that farmers from regions all across BC express to us. There's a variety of strategies that 
these farmers use for collecting and responding to feedback from their customers. And Caroline talked about a few of these in the previous section. Um, just one example to share with you. So Three Crows Farm, located in Cranbrook, uh, used a simple strategy when they started to take on restaurant clients. They weren't really sure about their capacity to meet the demands of this kind of market. So they started off by offering um, only a few products that they knew they could confidently supply. Then they gradually expanded their offerings once the relationships were established and they knew that they could more consistently supply the market. So getting feedback from your customers, whether it's customers you see at the market or um, restaurant clients, or your regular CSA customers is really important um, and can really help you to refine your business and your production plans. So it's important to pick a system for communicating with your customers that works for you. Um, this can be email, phone, text, um, or in person, and make sure that your customers know what the best way to get a hold of you is. The simplest strategy really is to just get to know your clients. And this was something that a lot of the farmers we talked to found really re rewarding, the opportunity to talk to, to people and um, get to know who was buying their food. And this also really helps customers uh, to feel comfortable when they're giving feedback to you. And you can also feel more comfortable when you're asking for it. So farm operation improvement um, is an ongoing process as your business finances, human resources, land capacity, uh, marketing strategy changes throughout change throughout the years. Uh, most businesses have a sort of a set kind of backbone system for their operation, um, but a lot of the subsystems could. So in this section, uh, we'll talk about some some ways that farmers can alter their farm operations to maximize op maximize operation efficiency and economic opportunity. And as Walpack mentioned, um, ongoing record keeping is like essential for evaluating your farm operation season after season. Um, the first practice, um, diversify production to maximize market returns and minimize risk. Usually the competition edge of farmers markets farmers is the diversity of products. Diversification is a strategy for lowering risk, building consumer, uh, consumer loyalty, and to attract a wider demographic of customers. The mix of crops to grow isn't decided solely decided um, based on what the farmers want to grow. It is a well thought out decision based on market trends, consumer demands, um, competition, financial returns, and the farmer's own strength and weaknesses. This diversification needs to be balanced well with management capacity and financial goals that fit within the overall operation. So over the years, farmers will start to notice the products that sell exceptionally well and those that do not. Um, based on many factors such as geographic region, consumer purchasing power, market demands, the farm is constantly evaluating what crops do well and which do not do well. With this information, farmers create an appropriate crop mix that includes crops that are high in value, high in turnover rate, but also crops that um, even though they're not as high in value, they are staples in many consumers' diets. Um, you want the consumer to step into your stall and hopefully be able to buy all the veggies that they would need for the week and maximize uh, their spending at your stall. And in, in addition to crop mix, farmers can also diversify at the farm or that, sorry, diversify services at the farm given sufficient financial resources and capacity. For example, expanding into agritourism services such as wedding events or long table events, or expanding into value added products or UPIC services. Um, having said all that, farmers can only do this after having properly assessed their business. It's easy to want to do many things, but narrowing and focusing on a manageable scope is critical as it is easy to get too ambitious. So increase value added farm products and services to access unique growth and revenue generation opportunities. This ties in with diversification of products and services. After doing some cost benefit analysis, you may find that you have the capacity to dabble into crops that are a bit more specialized and unique in the marketplace. 
This will give you an edge in the market. The key is to recognize the market gap one step ahead of everyone. This will strengthen your market presence and open up revenue generation opportunities. So increasing crop and service diversification does not always mean expanding your scale. It can mean the opposite, actually, um, because expanding and scale doesn't always mean higher profit. It's about altering your production so that farmers are farming smarter and more efficiently. Identify the production gaps um, or the, the crops that are taking, a lo taking up a lot of space on your fields but not giving a high return and make changes based on those information. It could mean scaling down, um, investing in better and more efficient infrastructure or processing equipment. Many small-scale farms also include value added in their product lines, especially for crops that are very abundant and, and farmers just can't sell all of it. For example, zucchini made into zucchini relish. Um, the next practice, uh, making a strategic direct investment to take advantage of niche markets and also making strategic investments to reduce production costs or increase enterprise profitability. So once you have identified a market gap or niche market, you need to look at your records to see whether your operation is capable of doing so in terms of um, all these aspects such as finances and personnel and capacity. Then maybe come up with a strategy to make that investment. For example, a lack of processing facility may lead a farm to investing in their own processing facility. Processing facility. Not only does this allow the farm to do the processing on their own terms, this also allows the farm to customize their processing operation and generate extra income from maybe having other farmers use it, especially if that area is lacking in, in such a uh, facility. Another example would be recognizing the crops that are still lacking in the current market and then assess whether your farm has the capacity and finances to make investments to grow and market these certain crops. At some point in your farm operation, um, especially as you want to grow bigger, farmers have to strategically improve the efficiency of production and lowering costs. This is usually achieved, achieved by a variety of ways, such as using specialized tools, improving systems, and introducing mechanization. Tying into the benefit of accurate record keeping, reviewing this information, and doing a cost-benefit analysis allows the farmers to understand their production and see where they can improve on efficiency and reduce costs. For example, labor is usually the highest cost for a farm operation, so finding ways to reduce that cost um, through mechanization or of buying specialized tools could be a strategic investment for some farms. Lastly, the last tax practice for farmer operation is maintain or gain control over processing activities to ensure product quality and to respond to market demands. Uh, one benefit that many customers visit the farmer's markets for grocery shopping is to be able to meet the farmers who actually grow the food. The mon non-monetary value is the relationship with the farmers because customers are paying into the direct knowledge of knowing how their food is grown, um, the farm it came from, and knowing the farm on a more farmer on a more personal level. So it is essential for farmers to have control and knowledge of all production and processing activities of their products to ensure product quality and to be able to respond to any consumer questions regarding the process. Um, sometimes, of course, this can't always be achieved, especially if you have to send your products somewhere else, um, for example, maybe livestock that gets sent to slaughterhouses or butchering shops, but it is encouraged that farmers do as much as they can to understand. And this just enforces the points about being transparent in your, in your operation. Um, and so finally, every, op every farm operation is different depending on farm size, farm location, market in the area, you know, farmer's experience, and even personnel personalities. So as a farmer, you know that every farm business is different and unique as farming is such a multifactorial operation. Sometimes it will take several years for farmers to figure out the best balance and in my personal experience some farms still alter their farm operations and marketing strategy fairly regularly despite being in the industry for decades. So I think it's essential to keep in mind that marketing is an ongoing work in progress and that farmers should always work towards improving their farm operations through very 
um, up-to-date and accurate record keeping. Okay, and uh, we're getting close to 8 o'clock, so I'm going to go through uh, these last few examples as quickly as I can so we can get to some questions. Um, Caroline talked about the idea of increasing diversity on your farm as a key strategy to help you gain market share and reduce the impact of the risks of farming. Um, this means branching out to new marketing channels, crop diversity, or enterprise diversity. And we talked to farmers who were exploring this idea of diversity in a lot of different ways. Uh, for example, Lauren Taves from Taves Family Farm in Abbotsford has, over um, his years of farming in the valley, built a business by managing a variety of diverse enterprises under his farm banner. Um, this includes a, a poultry operation. He grows greenhouse vegetables um, for wholesale distribution and distribution at the farmer's market, as well as berry production and, and an agritourism component um, that's known as the apple barn, which is open seasonally. There's also the idea of marketing diversity. So Paul and Marlene from Apple from Happy Pig Organic Farm have explored marketing diversity by engaging in different and creative ways for selling what they produce. Um, this includes starting up a produce delivery service where they deliver organic produce along with their pasture-raised meats and a food truck, um, which they take to farmers markets and festivals in their region. Um, selling prepared food made with their products. There's also crop and product diversity, and Robert from Pilgrim's Produce has focused um, in his 20 plus years of farming on building a farm that's incredibly diverse um, in what they produce. And this offers his customers a really wide variety of products when they come to uh, buy from his farmer's market stand or visit the farm for you pick. Um, it also has helped him manage some of the risks associated with weather or pests um, and other unpredictable unpredict aspects of farming. So another thing that Caroline mentioned um, was making strategic investments. And this can be um, of capital, of time, or even both. Um, and it can be a way to address some of the cha some challenges that you might face in production or marketing. So a couple of examples we have here, uh, Chris and Michael, who are farming partners at Three Crows Farm, have invested in scale appropriate harvesting equipment for cutting high value salad greens. And this attaches to just a regular power drill. Um, this has dramatically reduced labor time during their harvest. Uh, which can be a significant output, especially for a small farm like theirs. And now they're looking for other ways that they can use this equipment, thinking about what other crops they might be able to harvest with this method. Robert from Pilgrim's Produce has built, focused on building greenhouse infrastructure early on in his farming career. And this has allowed him to bring crops to the market sooner than other farmers in his region giving him a competitive edge at the market. Um, he's also able to extend his season and get an additional crop rotation in the spring. Uh, and finally, we're talking about processing and sort of managing that step um, when you're trying to get your products to the market. And we were talking about how controlling this step is important um, just in the management of your overall operations. And also, um, when you want to ensure that your customers are getting a really high quality product. So Pat from Stonefield Farm um, makes it a priority to be highly involved in the processing of her meat products. And she even uh, maintained this commitment when she shifted from a smaller abattoir facility to a larger one. Um, and the smaller facility, she was able to have more control over how her animals were handled and processed, and this wasn't necessarily the case in the larger facility. So in order to make this smooth transition, she made a point to observe the process and make recommendations to this processor um, so that she could ensure that her customers would still get a quality product and she could reduce some of the waste that came along um, when she shifted over to this, this larger processor. 
Another example is Lisa and Hen from Sterling Springs Chicken, who invested in on-farm processing and packaging facilities as a way to gain control over that processing value chain step. Um, in addition, another benefit is that they were also able to have more flexibility in marketing and retailing. So they're now able to set their own schedules for processing and adjust how much they produce and when they process to meet the demands of the market. So that wraps up uh, the content and some of the farmer examples for the webinar. Um, just a few final thoughts as we sort of close things up and get ready for questions. Uh, if anyone has questions right now, you can go ahead and start um, typing them in. That would be great. We'd love to answer them. Um, and if we can't answer them, we can try and address them maybe talk to some of the farmers and, and try and address them and get back to you later. Um, so a key insight from our farmer interviews was in the interrelatedness of all the best business practices in a farm business context. So your approach to human resources will impact your opportunity to diversify, and this influences your marketing strategy and so on and so on. It's also important to remember, and I think we mentioned this earlier, that it's not about mimicking other operations, but about understanding how these best business practices can work best for you. So we've provided some examples of how they're used um, in the context of different farms around the province. And it's really important to think about how um, those farms have implemented some of these business, best business practices in the context of their larger farm operation. And the guide that we've produced um, is a really good way of helping to understand this. It sort of gives uh, an overview of the farm and talks a little bit about how they've integrated some of these best business practices. Um, the farmers that we interviewed also talked about working with their natural strengths, whether it's production or human resource management or marketing or financial analysis, and then being confident in seeking support from their farmer par farming partners or neighbors or family members or mentors in areas where they might not be so naturally inclined. And of course, um, to not be discouraged if business management or marketing or record keeping doesn't come so naturally to you. These are skills, just like any other skills, um, and they might need to be developed, especially for farmers who might not have a business background. Um, and in supporting, it's, a, it's the hope of a project like this that we can start to build a framework to support farmers and support farmers who support other farmers. Um, and both the BC Association of Farmers Markets and the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems are committed to this. So we've also collected a few uh, resources that might help um, to sort of take your learning a little bit further. Um, and they're here on this slide, and we'll also provide a PDF copy of this information to people as well um, after the webinar. But we just wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that are out there and some of the resources that came to our attention when we were talking to farmers. Uh, there's just a few more online resources and some books and uh, resources in other media forms. So again, we'll um, send this out along with the other um, documents at the end. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the uh, webinar content. And we have about 20 minutes for questions. I'm curious if anyone has any questions that they'd like to share with us. Um, even sort of simple questions we're happy to answer or um, happy to direct you in the direction of somewhere where you might be able to find some of this information. Thank you.
farms we interviewed were certified organic? Um, how many of the farms we interviewed were certified organic? That's a good question. Off the top of my head, how many? Sorry. How many? <laughs> um, off the top of my head, I don't know, but I'll, I'll have to look at the um, list. So organic certification was something that came up when we talked about record keeping um, and the farmers that we talked to mentioned that um, becoming organically certified was an opportunity for them to really hone their record keeping skills because they're required to keep, um, to document lots of things um, when through the certification process. So when um, we're thinking about sort of honing some skills and, and that sort of thing, the, the idea of organic certification came up um, as an opportunity for, for sort of learning systems for record keeping. Um, and there's another question, can you suggest any good resources or grants for young farmers trying to acquire land to farm? Uh, maybe Caroline can answer this question. She is a young farmer, farming. <laughs> um, I know there are several grants available to small, like if you're starting a small farm business, but I, I can't think of one on top of my head right now, but it could be part of our resource page later. Um, and as for acquiring, acquiring land, um, the Young Agrarians actually have a really good program. Um, where they pair up new farmers who want to farm with um, old, uh, landowners who have available land. Um, and they have a whole kind of a resource guidebook on their website. And I'm not sure if you can all read um, these questions, but someone just wrote in Farm Credit Canada grant um, as well as a resource for um, accessing grants for young farmers. So we'll add some um, resources about land access and grants to the resource page. And um, there are also grants through the government that supports um, farms that hire employees that are, you know, that fit a certain criteria, like if it's a student or they're under 30. So there are these grants available to to business or farm business owners who are looking to hire. And uh, that's a good point because uh, uh, one specific farm that we talked to, Three Crows Farm, uh, they're quite a small operation, so two farming partners, um, and they mentioned tapping into that, those grants from the federal government to get subsidies to be able to hire staff. Um, as a small operation, they wouldn't otherwise be able to hire staff in most cases, so a program like that really makes it possible for them um, to get some additional help during the summer. And this is not necessarily grants, but Van City does have kind of low interest loans for many small farm businesses. They are very supportive of um, small farms. And if you have a, a pretty solid business plan, you can always bring it to them and you know see. And they work on it case, on a case by case basis as well. And if anyone else is curious about additional resources, um, you can definitely uh, ask that question now, and we'll be sure to add uh, that to the resource page that we send out. And I think we um, had an answer to the question about organic certification. So we think about five farmers that we spoke to um, were organically certified, so that's about a third of the, the farmers that we talked to. When you said low rate of interest, what is it? Do you know what the interest rate? No, <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to. It's on the website. It's on the website, though. You can easily look for it. Yeah, we're not 100% sure um, on the interest rate for the Van City grants, but you can look it up on their website, and we'll add that to the resource page.
Any other questions out there? I think we had, um, uh, how does everyone do cost analysis when raising many animals of different ages? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure if we can, I don't, I'm not sure if Wallapack has any insight on, <laughs> on how to manage something like that, but um, might be a little bit too specific for us to answer sort of secondhand from farmers. We'll make note of that question and see if we can find um, any resources. I'm not sure if there's anyone else out there who has any insights on um, on that question. Yeah, we didn't talk to anyone who was raising rabbits. I think we ha we had um, some questions that people wrote in ahead of time um, about specifically about marketing and sort of looking to increase their sales at the farmers market um, or dealing with days that are slow um, and some of what we talked about or what Caroline talked about during the marketing section really addresses that but I think we were having a conversation about that earlier um, and sort of wanted to emphasize the importance of engagement in a setting like that. So something like um, having samples and uh, making sure that you're out in front and talking to people at the farmer's market is really important um, in a situation like that. So we just wanted to address that question that we had in advance. Uh, so we, we had a little um, bit of insight maybe. We have enterprise budgets on the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems website, but Wallapack was just saying that um, those enterprise budgets don't actually differentiate between the ages of animals. So yeah, the comment about connecting directly with the farmer um, and getting some, some first-hand information about that might be a good, a good idea. I, I I think it's probably pretty similar to like in the, in a farm where you um, grow many crops at the same time, and this is like same animal but just at different age. So each age they will also have um, different requirements. Like mm -hmm. you know, they, you have to take vaccine or you have different seeds. So I think it would take a lot of detailed record keeping. So. We have a few more minutes for questions if there are any more. Uh, that might be a question for the BC Association of Farmers Markets to answer. Um, as a market manager, I've been told that sampling isn't actually allowed by Vancouver Coastal Health. I don't know if, uh, Georgia, if you want to address the question about sampling. Um, how does a new vendor compete in a very busy market with dedicated consumers? Um, that's a good question. So how does a new vendor compete in a very busy market with dedicated consumers? And I think the farmers that we talked to um, really focused on sort of building and establishing 
um, sort of building and establishing their brand and their brand identity before uh, entering into the market. And that really helped them to sort of gain a good following quickly. Um, and some of the other strategies around um, using social media, so creating that presence that allows you to connect with uh, people sort of between markets um, is a good strategy as well. Yeah, so I guess it's sort of um, tying back to the first point about crafting your story when it's even though if you're even if you're growing the same vegetables as all the other farmers, um, you know some some customers will still you know maybe relate specifically to your story and then they will start following your business. So I think <clears throat> taking the time to dedicate your just your business kind of goals and values and stories first is a very good way to kind of compete in a very busy market. We also talked to a farmer on Vancouver Island, Amara Farm, uh, who was a very small, sort of small scale starting out and con was concerned about competing in a market that was really well established. Uh, and the solution there was to link up with another producer in the area, also a small scale vegetable producer. And they started a marketing cooperative, so they brought their um, products to the farmer's market as a cooperative and that made sure that they were sort of able to um, bring enough bounty to the table um, to sort of compete or um, compete alongside other bigger um, venues. And yeah, that's Merville Organics is the name of the cooperative. So that's a strategy as well. I mean, not a strategy for everyone, but um, definitely a strategy that we learned about through this research. Um, yeah, and there's a, a, an answer there that addressed um, the question about sampling. And maybe that's something we can also add to the, if there's any resources to pass along about that, we can add that to the resource page as well. And I'm not sure if there's any more questions. Uh, we have a few more minutes. If there aren't any more questions, um, Oh, the question, there's a question um, about feedback from farmers about what farmers markets can do to better support them. And I think uh, to address that question, a lot of the, when we talked to farmers, uh, a lot of them talked about the farmers market as sort of a really essential marketing channel for them because they had that sort of point of contact with their customer base and um, it provided a venue where customers sort of know where to find them each week. Um, but I think as sort of businesses grow and diversify, some of the farmers we talked to talked about scaling back a little bit at the farmer's market, um, if they can, particularly because they're sort of time and, and resource intensive, even though there's that uh, positive trade-off of having um, that connection with customers which can build sort of a really loyal base. Um, so I'm not sure if that sort of directly answers that question, um, but sort of recognizing that farmers were really conscious of the time um, that they were putting into selling at, at farmers markets um, and sort of thinking of ways that they can sort of get the same kind of return um, without putting in uh, so much so much physical time. And I think things like community supported agriculture um, or things that came up or even people starting to sell, sort of building up that customer base and starting to sell directly to 
um, clients rather than going through the farmer's market um, channel because they're able to sort of work um, more within their own schedules. So those were sort of reasons that came up for farmers shifting part, at least part of their marketing strategy away from farmer's market. My question is, sorry, I don't really understand that question. Uh, I'm, I think maybe that question about the ratio of farmers to food producers and artisans is maybe one that BC ASM um, can answer. I'm not sure if I can answer Emily, that. Emily, I can jump in on okay. that question. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, Molly Ann, it would really, uh, so the question is, about the ratio of farmers to food producers and artisans at a farmer's market. And um, I guess the percentage discussion is sort of a big discussion, but just in terms of like the makeup of a market and making that decision, I would say it really depends on the, on the individual farmer's market and knowing your demographic and your customer base. Cause some markets, for example, have quite a few tourists coming through um, and that would impact, um, say, the number of crafters and farmers that you had at the market because tourists may want certain types of produce, but they probably won't be doing a bunch of grocery shopping. So um, if you wanted to call the office, we could talk about that in more detail too and see if we could um, give you any tips. Thanks, Georgia. Yeah, so I think, uh, as Georgia said, it would be good to connect with BCFM on that specific um, question about sort of building up your um, customers and finding the right mix of farmers to other vendors. So I think we've reached 8.30, um, which is the concluding time of the webinar. Um, and again, we want to thank everyone for taking time out of their Monday night. Uh, we know it's a busy time of year. And I'm just flipping through here because I wanted to share our contact information. Um, so this slide just has contact information for myself and Wallapak and Caroline uh, here at the Institute, um, as well as websites for the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems at Kwantlen Polytechnic University and the BC Association of Farmers Markets. So um, if you have any more questions or need any more information, please contact us. And uh, we'll also be sending up, uh, sending out a follow-up email with the resources uh, produced from this project and those additional resources as well. So thanks everyone for participating and we hope you have a nice rest of your evening. Thanks everyone.